I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head which of the Gospels where Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world, and it seems like secular society is desperate in proving him correct. I mean, we know he's correct because he's Jesus, but... Right. <laughs> you know, they, they're trying to demonstrate every day that they've sold their soul to the devil, so... Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competitive shooting, the natural right of self-defense, and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. For those of you who are new to the show, I I appreciate you tuning in, and I hope you will come back because I think you're going to like what we do today because it's going to be fun. We're joined uh, for the first time in 2022 from the land of 10,000 frozen lakes, the pistol pack and padre himself, the straw that stirs the drink, your friend and mine. Pastor John Bennett, welcome back. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. And and yes, our lakes are very frozen right now. I believe with the wind chill, it's about twenty five below. Oh, dear Lord. Forty below tomorrow. Nice balmy day. <laughs> if you aren't awake in the morning, when you get out of bed, you will be when you step outside. Who? Good grief. <laughs> Well, I I, uh, I hope you had an, an awesome Christmas and New Year, and I hope you're you're having a wonderful winter of severe illness and death, as Joe Biden <laughs> called it. <laughs> I think maybe he was just talking about his poll numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he may have been, because I think he's taken his poll numbers and shot them square in the face. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it is our first Clinging to God and Gun show of 2022, and um, what that means for those of you who have not been here before, you'll find out in a minute. But first, I want to thank all the folks who made this show possible. The members of the Reformation Gun Club this week, a special shout out to Anthony from Cottonwood Heights, Utah, Robert from DeKalb, Illinois, Richard from Wichita, Kansas, Paul from McKinney, Texas, right down the road from me, and Mitch in Stockbridge, Michigan. Thank you all so much for your support. Um, Armed Lutheran Radio is listener-funded, and that means that we don't have any advertising. We don't have any sponsors. We rely on the uh, generosity of the members of the Reformation Gun Club, men and women from all over the country who value what we do and who put their money where their mouth is. And if you would like to find out more about the benefits of becoming a member, and help support the show, visit armedlutheran.us slash gun club, or look for a link in the show notes for this or any of us, uh, any of our previous episodes. All right, today we're doing something a little different, something I came up with um, uh, during, uh, during the Christmas break while I was thinking of some new things to throw into the mix here. You know, advice columns go, I didn't know this, but they go back to the late 17th century. I think it was the 1690s when the first advice column appeared in a London newspaper. The most famous, for those of you who know what newspapers are, for for the younger generation, bear with us. <laughs> they actually <laughs> printed words on paper, um, and uh, that's how people got their news. The most famous of these advice columns was uh, probably Dear Abby, um, which started in the 1950s, and and by the time I think. In the 1980s, at some point, there were it was being published in over 1,200 American newspapers. And believe it or not, or believe it or not, advice columns are still a thing, um, just in digital form. And so today we're playing Ask the Pastor, and I'm going to read some real gun-related questions, uh, and have the pastor, if you would respond to this these questions, the to these wayward souls as though they were a member, maybe a friend or a member of your congregation. And, uh, and then take a guess at, at how uh, you think maybe the, the columnist responded. And to give you a hint, um, these, all three of these are from Slate.com. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, and and I, I find it still deeply ironic that, that after everything that has gone on in the media universe with with the news media that people are still turning to journalists for advice <laughs> right, exactly. 
exactly. It's the scary thing about how, um, yeah, you you wonder why it is that that this our society is so messed up. All you have to do is scroll through some of these advice columns. I spent I spent a couple of hours just scouring through, looking for interesting things, and and I I felt like I needed a shower afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I've heard some of these on various podcasts that deal with you know. Hey, you know, my, my wife wants to, uh, us to have an open marriage or something and, you right. know, and it's like, yeah, you should go for it. Um, yeah, <laughs> again, I'm getting married next week, but my, my husband, my uh, fiance's brother is super hot and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, society is doomed. <laughs> yes. Yes. What well, what's happened is that, you know, I, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head which of the Gospels where Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. And it seems like secular society is desperate in proving him correct. I mean, we know he's correct because he's Jesus, but... Right. <laughs> you know, they, they're trying to demonstrate every day that they've sold their soul to the devil, so... Yep. Uh, a quick perusal of any of these uh, online advice columns will will make you wish for Jesus's return. That is for sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> what they have done is made the editors of Cosmopolitan magazine circa 1990 blush. All right. So here's the first one. Here we go. Dear Pastor B, uh, my mom, her husband, and some of my siblings have started carrying concealed weapons recently. I have a young child, and I want to make sure that none of our family has guns anywhere near him. My mother told me that their guns would be locked up during Christmas. But when I saw her a few days later, her husband admitted he was carrying a gun while he held my two-year-old. Now I'm worried about what Christmas will be like with them. How do I address this concern with my mom without alienating her and my other gun-carrying siblings? Before we travel the long distance home for the holidays, I need to make sure there will not be guns around my son or any of the kids. My sense is that she does not want to stand up to her husband on this. I really hate having to utilize the phrase, they are otherwise wonderful human beings, but they are otherwise wonderful human beings whom I love dearly, so I want to find a peaceful way to deal with this from a distance before Christmas. Signed, Guns and Poinsettias. So, how would you respond to that? Well, I would respond first by asking, dear guns and poinsettias, which uh, I think is a strange moniker for someone who seems to hate guns so much. Uh, do I hope she doesn't hate poinsettias as much as she hates guns. Apparently. Right. Well, unless you have a you know pollen allergy or something, which would be entirely different. Um, right. <laughs> but you talked about the trip to go see your parents. And the question is, are you traveling by automobile? Because if you are, you have a significantly higher probability of you and your child dying while traveling via car to get to see your family than you would have any possibility of your child or you being harmed by your loved one's carrying concealed firearms. Mm. If it were so horribly dangerous, why did you not notice that your father was carrying a firearm while holding your child? Mm -hmm. I would presume, presume that it's not the presence of a firearm that offends you, but the very idea of it. Right. Your child has a, a far more likely uh, possibility of being stabbed or punched to death than being shot to death. So perhaps you should look at it as just another inanimate object that, if used responsibly, isn't going to cause you one bit of harm. And if the chance was ever to arise, God forbid, it could also save your life. Right. Signed, Dear Pastor B. <laughs> Yeah, and and it's interesting that that she's not talking about parents leaving guns lying out. That would be a completely different conversation. But we're talking about guns that she can't even see and wouldn't have known if she hadn't been told about them. Right, so. and I would guess that that 
she has a bathtub in her home, which if that's the case, a two-year-old is more likely to drown to death in a bathtub than be shot mm-hmm. by his loving grandfather. Yes. Yep. <sighs> Absolutely. So uh, how do you suppose that uh, the advice columnist at Slate.com decided to answer this one? I don't know what it is, but it can't be good. (laughs) Here, here, Here it goes. They may well be otherwise wonderful human beings, but their flippant attitude towards firearm safety trumps everything else. If your mother and her husband can't agree to uphold her promise to you that their guns would be locked up when the toddlers are in the house. Now, is if you try, let's see, was that a promise? Said their guns would be locked up during Christmas. Okay. See, they promised they would lock up the guns during Christmas. They didn't say anything about, you know, the rest of the year. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing that dear old dad was, was uh, carrying concealed on a non-Christmas day, so... Uh, if your mother and husband, perhaps, if they can't agree to uphold their promise that their guns will be locked up when the toddlers are in the house, if your mother can't even have a conversation about it, they have no business owning guns. Not just, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, they know how you feel. If they can't ensure that all firearms will be out of reach of your two-year-old, let them know you won't be celebrating Christmas with them this year. Signed, The Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is one of those cases, though, where if I had the opportunity, to, assuming this is, you know, there wouldn't be a member of my congregation saying this because I think the only person who thinks like that left because uh, I wasn't a Democrat or something like that. Um, <laughs> but if... If this was a member of my congregation, I would say, you know, I, I can, I can, you know, understand your your uh, concern being around something that you perceive perceive to be dangerous. Um, you know, maybe be helpful if you learned a little bit more about it. Let me take you shooting. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Demystify the guns so that you're not so so scared of them that that. Um, you know, the other podcast that I used to, um, unload and show clear, we had a number of guests who said, you know, for a long time, they, they didn't want anything to do with guns. And then they, once they were taken out to the range, uh, and had a chance to, to shoot them and learn how they work. Um, it took away all of that kind of that, that mystery about them, the scariness about it. It it wasn't scary anymore because they understood how, how to handle them safely and how they worked. And, and a lot of these people who are determined that they don't want anything to do with guns have never even been around them, um, never even held one or fired one. So, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, and a lot of it, you know, you can blame the media because every story about a gun shooting, the, the media makes it sound like firearms are capable of, of <laughs> wreaking mass carnage without any human interaction. So... <laughs> Yeah, you, you can understand to some degree of, of you know, if, if a person only relies on the mainstream media for their firearms information that uh, they could indeed yep. be very leery about guns. Yep. All right, so here's the second one. Uh, Dear Pastor B, my husband and I have been together for 16 years, and thankfully we get along beautifully and are best friends. There has been one issue, though, on which we have never agreed. Should we have a gun in our house? We do not have kids and rarely do any kids visit our home, so that is not a factor. He believe it's, believes it's the right thing to do to protect ourselves. I fear having a gun in our home could lead to a tragic accident, such as a friend entering our home and being mistaken for an intruder. I also fear that if, God forbid, I actually need to use the gun to protect myself, I would freeze up and not be able to use it and have the tables turned on me. In response, my hubby has said that we would both go, uh, go get shooting lessons from professionals. Our neighborhood isn't the greatest, but it certainly doesn't fear. I don't, but I certainly don't fear for my life walking the streets. 
but uh, one never knows what can happen in this crazy world. Overall, I fear this disagreement will eventually lead to an I told you so situation on the part of one of us, and whatever would lead to that would be a terrible occurrence. Can you take a shot? Oh, that's a terrible pun. <laughs> at, at giving us some advice on how to come to a consensus. Signed, Gunshy. Ah, okay. This is an interesting one. Uh, because the uh, the writer here sounds very much like my wife would have sounded when we first uh, got married. Mm -hmm. So mine too. Yeah, dear Gunshy. Um, first, I wanted to encourage you that if you are concerned about your actions, if you were ever to be faced with a situation where you needed to defend your life. Uh, all the more important first to get training and second uh it's certainly fine to not revert to using a firearm in a case like that if you are not proficient and capable of, of using that firearm responsibly so first and foremost what would be different between not using a firearm for yourself in a situation like that and the situation that you have right now where there is not a firearm in the house. Mm -hmm. Now, I, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, you're, you're worried about if a, a stranger or not even a stranger, I think she said a friend was to come into the house and stumble across the firearm. Well, it's, it's important to understand safe storage of a firearm. There mm -hmm. are reliable storage methods, uh, biometric safes, digital keypad safes uh, where it's easy to get access to the firearm quickly while also making sure that it is secure against any unauthorized use. Uh, if you have received proper training, there really is nothing to fear because in the end, this is as much a, a, a self-defense tool at your disposal as if you had a baseball bat or a knife in the house. Either one of those weapons could become a weapon of opportunity for an intruder. But if you have control over the storage and the use of a firearm in your home, you are well prepared to be able to confront any lethal threat that you may encounter in your life. At the same time, I also want to, I would encourage this person to, uh, if you're going to get training make sure it's the right kind of training. Uh, mm -hmm. There are no shortage of, of shysters out there who will gladly take your money and teach you everything wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know of someone who their, their first handgun purchase was a high point because that's what their firearm instructor recommended. Oh Lord. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I hope he yes. does. I hope he's not listening to the show. But if he is, <laughs> I'm sorry you got that advice. I wish you would have asked me. <laughs> um, uh, now, for my permit to carry class here in Minnesota, uh, the class that I take is an online class where the instructor lets you do the all the coursework online, and then you make an appointment with him to to do the in person shooting. And I do that just for the the sheer uh, convenience of it. Most mm -hmm. of the classes around here, they're on a Sunday. Well, geez, guys, that's the one day a week I work. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, but in his online class, at least the last time I took it, he was still recommending that, you know, a person should carry a firearm in the largest caliber that they could comfortably shoot. And for me, that's a 45 ACP was basically what he said in the instruction. Right. So, yeah. Um, yes, Instructor Fudd. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so make sure you get training from someone who is specialized in teaching proper force-on-force -force training. Uh, perhaps it wouldn't be a good, uh, or perhaps it would be a good idea to maybe see if there's any IDPA clubs in your area because, this this sport is focused on defensive use of a firearm. 
And that mm-hmm. would also help you to gain some confidence so that, heaven forbid, if you ever have to use it, you are well prepared to do what's necessary to protect your life. Another another thing that, that I would recommend as in terms of training, um, what I did was I sent my wife to an NRA first steps class. Sure. Baby steps, and, yeah. Start, yeah, them out, so, start them out easy. <clears throat> yep. And I sent her with one of my guns, which just was not a good choice. And the instructor gave her options to, to try different things to see what worked. And then worked her through one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest drawbacks, a lot of problems a lot of women first-time shooters have is, is racking the slide of a, of a semi-automatic firearm. And my wife had a problem with that. Once she came home from the class, she did not have a problem with that anymore. Yeah. Um, so don't let your husband be the instructor <laughs> and find a good, competent, you know, um, entry level course to get your feet wet and then work your way up. Um, a lot of times you'll see people, you know, taking these sort of uh, um, fast roping kind of we're, we're, we're clearing rooms classes right. and we're, you know, the, the high speed, low drag stuff from operators. And it's like, are you really going to be doing this in a self-defense situation? Right. I, I understand these things are fun, but, does it fit what you intend, what you expect your firearms usage is going to be? And if your firearms usage is going to be, I need it to defend our home and our family from an intruder, you know, kicking indoors and, and clearing rooms isn't the thing. So, right. so find, find something that's a little better tailored to, um, to what your actual use case would be and do a little research. There's plenty of it out there as to what's reputable and what's not. Yes. And sadly, what happens so often is that a person takes whatever their state required classes for concealed carry, and they think that they've had mm-hmm. adequate training. And that, that yep. just simply is not the case. That's uh, the bare, bare minimum <laughs> yeah. a training that you can get. Yeah, that, um, that, that, that that's like taking your driver's ed class and then thinking that you're fully prepared to drive a big rig down the road. Right. So, you know, it's, and, and, you know, if, I don't know if we have any uh, people in our audience who are a little gun shy and maybe haven't made that step, but they're considering it a great way for a new shooter to get uh, comfortable with, with firing a weapon, especially for women is, you know, find someone who has a, a well-made 22LR semi-automatic pistol mm-hmm. because the slide is incredibly easy to rack. There's almost no felt recoil. And that's the first gun I had my wife shoot. Was It, wasn't, it was a revolver, not a semi-automatic. But she was like, oh, this is kind of fun. Yeah. And then <laughs> she said, okay, well... I want to try your gun. And, and at that time, the other gun, I only had two guns. I had the 22 revolver that I borrowed from my father. And I had, you know, you'll have to forgive me for this, but I had a love affair with 1911s. For, my first firearm was a 1911. And uh, <laughs> she went from shooting that 22 revolver to shooting 45 ACP. And uh, she said, "Nice. I want to go shoot. I want to go shoot the other one again. I, I, I'm done with this one." <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it's a great way to introduce someone who perhaps has an apprehension or a fear of firearms to showing them that you know, if if you're doing this safely and responsibility it, responsibly, it can be a whole lot of fun. Yep, yep. Great it, way to to spend time together, and and it was it's nice that you know. Uh, she does mention that her husband said they would both go shooting and get lessons from professionals. So I think if she's open to that, that's that's the way to go. Get yes. familiar with them so that fear of what would I do if I had to use it is no longer a fear. Yes, and and, and making sure you're just getting it from the right professionals too. Yeah. Yep. How do you think Slate responded to this one? Guns are bad. You shouldn't do it. <laughs> Divorce your husband well, if he gets one. 
Well, this is this. I was actually pleasantly surprised. Oh. I don't know whether somebody snuck into the Slate newsroom and and edited this, but here's their response. This is very much something you two will need to figure out as a couple. But there are a few basic principles that might serve as helpful guidelines. If you don't want to commit to using a gun yourself, then you absolutely don't have to. If that's a line you think you need to draw, then do so. If your husband feels equally committed to getting one, then you should both learn about the necessary safety precautions when it comes to storing a firearm in the home and have a plan in place before making the decision to acquire one. Whatever you do, whether you buy a gun or not, whether you both decide you would ever be willing to use it, you should at least be as close to on the same page as possible. I thought that was pretty even-handed. Yeah. Another thing that came to mind just now also is that depending on your state, you know, if, if you make the decision that, you know, I just, I just can't do it, I, I just don't feel safe having a firearm in the house. Mm-hmm. In, in many states, it's legal for the average citizen to get a, a pepper spray without any sort of permit. Right. Um, they also have, uh, and, and they look just like a hand, well, I should say just like, they look similar to a handgun, but they have ones that shoot uh, pepper balls. They have ones mm-hmm. that, that, you know, that they are CO2 operated that shoot a rubber pellet that is very painful. Um, so, you know, there, there are various alternatives if you decide that, you know, right now, at least at this point, I just don't feel comfortable doing it. Um, right. Ultimately, if you if you have a, a problem with your comfort level, that's when you should start looking for other gun owners that to talk to, and, and especially ones that perhaps were at the same point you were at some point in their life where they didn't feel comfortable with it, just to see where they're at and how they got to the point where they were okay with this. Um, yeah, my wife is okay with me owning guns. Um, I'm not quite sure how you know. Well, actually, I used to take that back. I know she doesn't like the idea of me buying more guns, <laughs> but but she that's is a okay conversation with me. for a whole different show. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, and and she can't remember the combination to the safe, so if more show up in there, she'd never know. <laughs> Mum's the word. Yes, <laughs> I. You know. I, I make this confession openly that if I was to come across Springfield Armory's new SA-35, which is a clone of the uh, mm. old high power, yep. if if one just magically appeared in my safe one day, I don't know how it got there, but... <laughs> All right, last one real quick. Um Uh, Dear Pastor B, my husband and I have been married for a year and a half, and we have a wonderful relationship. Before we got married, we discussed what we thought were the key uh, key deal breakers, children, career goals, finances, etc. When we disagreed, one of us always was willing to reach a compromise. One thing we agree to disagree about is gun control. I am a pacifist, and I despise guns. He feels he has the right to bear arms. We had the worst fight ever last year over the fact that we do not have a gun in our home. We live in a city, and he fears a break-in. He says guns can be stored safely, and he never knew where his dad's guns were kept. I don't understand the point of having one for defense if it's locked up. (laughs) Uh, We agreed to think about it and discuss it later, but it's been months, and he won't discuss it. We've been talking about having children, but I don't want to raise a child in a home with a gun, and he doesn't want to have a child in a house that's unprotected. I don't want to have a child until we can work this out. How do we reach a compromise when we both have such strong views? Also signed by Gunshy, but I think it's probably a different Gunshy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The other Gunshy seemed more reasonable. Yes. Well... I can understand your, you know, this person's apprehension if they have been raised in an environment where where guns were considered taboo. That's mm-hmm. the environment that my wife was raised in. She was very anti-gun, uh, politically conservative, but but anti-gun because of the experiences of of people close to her family when she was growing up. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a, it was I think it was a friend of her brother uh, that. Her brother had, wasn't at the party, but there was a party where 
um, you know, high school kids getting in trouble when parents aren't in the house. Um, they were drinking, and one of them knew where his dad kept his guns and was able to access those guns. Those guns weren't locked up. The gun was kept loaded, and he was messing around with it and accidentally shot his friend. Mm. Uh, so, so if that is your only reference point to firearms, it's very easy for someone to be very fearful about the idea of, of firearms being in the home. Um, first thing I would do with, with this person is, is demonstrate, you know, the, the, the safety features of a firearm. If a firearm is, is used in a responsible way, the, the biggest safety mechanism on that firearm is the trigger finger of the person holding it. Mm-hmm. That that firearm, unless that firearm has been abused and improperly maintained, the only way that firearm is going to fire if that is if that trigger is is intentionally pulled. Um, yes, there have been accidental discharges, even by seasoned gun owners, who weren't being responsible with the way they're handling that firearm. But as long as you're being responsible, as you know what the heck you're doing, that gun's not going to go off. Um, yeah. The next thing I would do is, is, is well, and maybe this isn't a, a, an order of operations necessarily, but have her call her, her non-emergency police line for the local police department and ask them what the reasonable response time is for an officer. Mm. Most people don't realize that... You know, if someone's trying to break into your house, by the time law enforcement gets there, whether you live in a rural area or you live in a city a few blocks away from a police department, that you could be looking at, you know, if in, in the latter case, in a city, you can be looking at bare minimum. You know, if they got there in five minutes, I would be completely shocked. <laughs> right. Okay. If they got there in 10 minutes, I'd be like, you know, that's, that's still impressive. 15. I'd be, you know, yeah, th- that's what I expected about a 15 minute response. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, how much carnage can someone with a depraved heart intending to do harm can do in that window of time from when the attempt of the break in starts until police arrive. Okay. Yeah. Unless you've got bulletproof windows, unless you have a security door that can withstand force up to, you know, a battering ram, you're not going to make it. And so she needs to understand what the response time is for police and also to look at the crime statistics, not just necessarily for her immediate neighborhood, but the surrounding area. You know, if if you have a, a high crime area that's just a few blocks away from where you live, even if it's been two years since the last murder within your vicinity, doesn't mean that you couldn't be the next victim. So knowing yeah. the risk that is present in your area you know she said well we don't live in the greatest area right there is an indicator that you know your life is at risk if you are not taking steps to protect yourself and someone intent on doing you harm is going to come to your door Um, you know and, and then from there get her acquainted with firearms in a way where she's going to have a respect for the proper use of firearms and slowly take away that fear. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And, and even if she comes out of, if you can expose her to firearms safely, even if she comes out the other end and still doesn't want a gun in the home, at least her, her, her reactions to these kinds of questions won't, will won't be irrational. Right. She can at least make a decision from a position of, of some intelligence about, about guns. And she says here, I don't understand the point of having one for self-defense if it's locked up. Yeah. Show, uh, 
the, show her how you know quick access safes work. Oh yeah, and that like, was one like of the like other points I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, you talked to her earlier about uh, about biometric safes and quick access safes. If she if she could understand, they don't have to be left sitting out. I think that, that sounds like that part of the misconception. She thinks that for it to be um, usable for self defense or home defense, it has to be lying on your nightstand where anybody can get to it. Right. No. It's, yeah, and that's not the case. Right. Um, if you so, if you live in a, a questionable area, you know, having the firearm on your person when you're at home isn't necessarily a bad idea. Right. If if, right. if I lived, you know, the area that I grew up in, if I lived there now when I was in my home, I would be carrying on my person, you know, except for when I'm sleeping. <laughs> Maybe then I'd have it under my pillow because it wasn't that great of an area at all. Um, but, uh, you know, it's if you keep your doors locked when you're home, which I would assume you would if you live in a questionable area, the amount of time that it takes for someone to break that door down versus the amount of time it takes you to access a firearm from a biometric safe. You know, you're talking about, you know, depending on where the safe is located in your house, it might take mm-hmm. you 10, 15 seconds to get to it. It's going to take that yep. intruder longer than that to get through that door. Yep. How do you, how do you suppose um, uh, salon.com responded to this? Well, you know, now I'm hesitant to say after the last reply. Um, <laughs> this one, I don't, I'm going to go with it's going to be an unreasonable anti-gun, guns are bad and K kind of response. Well, that's the interesting thing. And I think this is what makes the third one very interesting, considering the first two responses, which were very different. This one is almost a mix of the two. Huh. Um, They respond, talk about being held up at gunpoint. You can't start a family because your husband refuses to discuss the impasse you're at over firearms. His obstinacy, and then is he seething about this? She asks, is hardly making the case that you'll be safer with a gun in the house. So this is the interesting part about these, this response is the first half of this response, the, the advice columnist makes some really nefarious assumptions about the husband. You two come at this with strong, but rather inchoate views. You're a pacifist who loathes guns. That's, that's, a, that's it. You're a pacifist who loathes guns, but listen how she characterizes the husband. He's a Second Amendment purist who needs protection from the hordes stalking your city. <laughs> Instead of digging in, it would be helpful if each of you would concede the other has a point. See, this is where it gets weird. If, if everyone shared your view, there would be no need for guns, but they don't. So there is. You know, it's what? funny because... Every pacifist society in human history ends up being conquered by someone with guns. Well, conquered I mean, and subjugated, yes. B- before the, exist- the existence of guns, someone with weapons of some sort. Right, right. If, there, um, if everyone shared your view, there would be no need for guns, but they don't. So there is. If he acts as if the world outside your door resembles Grand Theft Auto, oh, he gosh. needs to be more realistic. <laughs> well, I don't know. If you live in Chicago, they had a record number of murders this past year, so maybe it would be a good idea to own a firearm. And there she comes next. Um, but if your neighborhood requires armed defense, then move. That's a little unrealistic advice. To suggest someone simply pick up and move, maybe they can't. Oftentimes, people that are in bad neighborhoods don't have the financial means to get out of them. Right. As for break-ins, ask him to explore alternatives that would make both of you comfortable. Maybe an alarm system and reinforced windows or doors. My guess is that for him, it's less about crime than his desire to be the kind of all-protective figure his father was... And that requires a gun. So see, she makes these really ugly suggestions that, that, that the husband is the problem because he has some weird macho right-wing ideas about 
the world. Yeah, it, it's it's almost. If I was to summarize, the, is there any more to this response yet? There is, and okay. this is where this before is, I go before you go to that. If I was to yep. summarize the response up till now, it would be, "You're right because toxic masculinity." <laughs> right. <laughs> up until this point, that's what it sounds like. It does. Your husband is the problem. But then she finishes with this. By nature, I have a terror of guns, but I came to have an appreciation for the pleasure of mastering firearms when I took target practice lessons a few years ago. Maybe one way to get over this impasse would be for both of you go to go to a firing range. If your husband won't get certified in safety and basic skills, then he's undone his own argument about gun ownership. But maybe he'll back off his insistence that you need a gun in your home if he sees you're willing to explore his point of view by wrapping your fingers around one and hitting a bullseye. Now, that last so, point, I think, is, you know, is fair to some degree. Um, yeah, she sneaks a little bit of that. She, but, she can't let go of the of the of the he's the problem, but right. But at the same time, the 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 woman requesting advice even admits that their neighborhood isn't the greatest, and they neighborhoods the city that aren't and the greatest. Yeah. Yes, those are the places where victims of crime often say, "I didn't think it would happen to me." Mm hmm. Yep. Never thought it would happen in my neighborhood. Yeah. Or it, the, the the neighborhoods where, I mean, the, the people who most often say that kind of thing are living in neighborhoods that they thought, well, this is a safe place to live. Well, I, there's no reason for us to have a gun. And then something yeah. happens. They're like, I never thought it would happen here. Yeah. Oh, look, there's a Unitarian church just down the street. <laughs> it's so safe. They fly the rainbow flag. This is just my kind of neighborhood. Uh, yep. Yep. But I, I do appreciate the advice at the end about going to the range. Yes. Um, I don't like the additional dig at the husband, but I do think it's, uh, and I, I was really surprised for her to suggest that she came to have an appreciation for firearms herself when right. she went out and overcame her own fear of guns. So I thought that was, that was good advice, but this yeah this one this is more schizophrenic it's like a they took the first two answers and like put them in a blender and there you go yeah <laughs> someone needs to see a psychologist that's all i can say all right that was fun that, that was uh, i kind of thought that might be so i'm i'm glad we did this um pastor thank you so much for doing it you know it is always fun to do this and we're at almost 300 episodes. I know that it hasn't been you and I for all these 300 episodes, but you know, this has been a whole lot of fun and I hope we go for another 300 more. I do too. I do too. I agree wholeheartedly. And folks, uh, thank you all for, for being with us for nearly 300 episodes. And I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope if you have any questions or any comments or any complaints about what you heard here, uh, on this episode, please visit our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback. Send us a voicemail or a voice message uh, or an email. We'd love to hear from you and respond either directly to you or on the show at some point. Um, next week is going to be, I don't know what next week is going to be. It's going to be a surprise. Um, that's the joy of the new format. Uh, so <laughs> until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Check out the Facebook page, The Armed Lutheran, or join our Facebook group, Fans of Armed Lutheran Radio. If you like what you hear, please leave us a comment on our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback or a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network.